how long how long have we got this evening am i am i assuming an uh, about sort of up to an hour and yeah that's only about how it goes yeah about an hour and then yeah yeah i have to wonder i've got i've got a lot of slides so i might just have to cut myself off at some point to avoid boring you too much <laughs> no problem if you do need to stretch it a bit it's not a problem no, no, no. I might. Like to have you. Well, thank you. I am. Um, it's more my energy levels as well. I'll see where I get. Well, I, have to, I might just have to scrap the last project. That better not be the most confidential one, though. Uh, no, it's, it's not. not. The best to last, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Should uh, should we start? Yeah, hang on. I'm just I'm 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 trying to share my screen. I'm looking at it. I might have to change some security settings. One second. Uh, everyone, I might have to leave this and rejoin you. I will be Not back. In, I will be back in a second. Okay, no worries. Who's going to fill the silence then? Me and me are up. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I just yeah, I've just realised either I need to talk to more people during the day or I need to have my meat on more because um, just loads of garbage <laughs> comes out of my mouth. Um, so it's all, it's all good, you're filling the silences. Um, sorry? It's all good, you're filling the silences. Yeah, to my detriment, I think, sometimes. But uh, we've got our guests back in the room. Um, thank you for saving me from the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was saying that while I was muted. Shall I, shall I just get going or is there an introduction or how's yeah, this Yeah, I think we can start. Okay. If, you, if you want, you can take it away. Sure, all right. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. I am delighted to be sitting in my living room <laughs> uh, talking to all of you. Um, I have a presentation this, this evening that is called Architecture as a Social Art. Um, and that is uh, a principle that follows through a lot of our projects and a lot of our work. Um, we very much have a social agenda in what we do, um, and that has been true ever since we began. So hopefully this will now work. Um, I've got a video to show you as well. I don't know if it will share the audio, but we can cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, what can you all hang on? Can you all see? Can you all see this first slide? Yes. Great. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, all right. Well, let us begin. So this um, this is the FD team, or this was the FD team a couple of years ago. Um, we're a fairly young team. The practice started in 2014, so we're we're six years old now, and um, yeah, we have come quite a bit further than I guess I would have hoped or anticipated when we when we began. Our work is split across roughly into thirds. So it's about a third residential. So this is just a selection of some of our um, private homes, residential projects. Um, it's about a third commercial. Um, there are some confidential projects on this slide I forgot about. 
Um, uh, but this is, a, this is a range of work from sort of arts and office buildings and, and various others. And then about a third of it is in the sort of public sector, education, um, third sector, sort of uh, charity clients, et cetera. And it's really these ones that I want to talk about this evening. Um, and this is, I guess, where a lot of our um, passion lies or, or where um, the projects that we enjoy doing the most, I guess, is, is the most important thing to say. So to begin with, uh, I think this is a really important point that the, the city is not a habitat that we evolved with. It is one that we created for ourselves. And this idea of our um, evolutionary needs and our evolutionary requirements um, is, is something that we really take to heart in terms of what is what is needed. And I think that comes across when we look at a couple of images here. So usually if I was presenting live, there would be a bit of audience interaction. And the, the question really is, what does this, this scene make you feel? And I think probably for most people, it's a bit um, uh, sad, slightly scary. Um, seeing a, a, a street like this, is it, it is not very uplifting. Whereas this, on the other hand, um, a community under a tree in a green space very much is that. Um, and that really comes back to a number of evolutionary traits and evolutionary instincts. Um, sort of one for biophilia, so the, the tree is the source of um, food um, and a green landscape as a source of uh, safety and, and obviously also of, of community. And it's this contrast that is something that, um, as architects, I feel is really important in terms of how do we shape our built environment and shaping that built environment to satisfy our, our needs and our, and our instincts. So that then raises this question that are the places we are creating um, helping or hindering our physical, social and psychological needs? And so to begin, I want to talk about loneliness and social isolation. And the, the answer, the implicit answer to that question, um, this question is that no, in many cases, the places we are creating um, are, are not helping. Um, so this project was a very, very short design sprint. And I'll show you in a, a video in a second. And it was based on the, the Haygate Estate in Elephant and Castle, um, which is this 1960s tower block here and the various other blocks around it. And this came about just after the, the government um, launched its uh, first ever loneliness strategy under Prime Minister Theresa May. And there were a number of statistics around this that are really quite um, worrying and upsetting. Um, loneliness, you, many of you may have heard, is, is deadlier than obesity and as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, young people uh, often feel lonely more often than any other age group of adults. Um, most people assume that it will be the elderly, but often it's 16 to 24 year olds. And so there are, there are many, many reasons that we need to, um, as architects and designers and as, as city shapers, uh, need to design to create an environment that is um, uh, more pro-social. Now, there is sound on this. If you can't hear the sound, give me a shout. This is about four minutes long. It's a really good um, introduction to the project. Um, but do say if you can't hear anything. Can't really pick anything up on that. Sorry, Thomas. I can't hear it either. Thank you. 
Can you hear us? Okay, it looks like we're slightly struggling to communicate with Thomas at the minute. Maybe it's because he, his audio is coming through the video. Um, is that right, Thomas? Sorry, can you hear the audio? No, we're struggling to hear it, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Um, all right, apologies for that. Um, in that case, I will, I will flick through and I will just talk to you very briefly about what the, what the project was about. So I, uh, the, it was a very, very short design sprint. Um, over the course of two days that involved uh, getting up and, and talking to people on this estate. And it was, the, the purpose behind it was really to create an installation that uh, changed people's day-to-day -day experience and sort of jolted them in some way and, and made them talk to each other. And it was a very, very simple um, piece, as you can see here. It, it, it began by installing um, several dozen yellow balloons in this undercroft um, under this housing estate. And these yellow balloons were, were very, very intentional in terms of their color because they were, they were bright, they stood out against the gray concrete that was the, the general area. And the balloons were very intentional because they're, they're, they're fun, people like them, and particularly kids. And kids will get quite excited when they see balloons and they'll pull their parents in. So there was a sort of design reason for, for, those, for those moves. But on these balloons, there were these baggage tags, which you can see swaying around there. And um, they, let me get to a, a point where you can see the messages. Yeah, so people would come in and put, put their own messages on these, on these baggage tags. Um, and those messages uh, said all sorts of things. So there was a message from a very elderly woman who had lived in the estate, um, uh, or had seen, had, had watched the estate being built. And there were sort of children, as you can see here, there were, there were people who had recently moved in. Um, yeah, this is, this is the woman who, uh, the, the elderly woman who had watched it being built. Um, and there were people like this, this gentleman who was um, sort of a very, very recent arrival. And so it was a very interesting way of um, people sort of getting very sort of small glimpses into, into their neighbors' lives and prompting conversations to happen. So people would wander around in these balloons and have a look at these messages and start talking to each other. And a lot of the case, they had never talked to each other before. And of course, you had, you had people of other, other cultures speaking other languages there as well. So it was, it was a really um, uh, interesting way of uh, sort of stimulating connection very, very quickly. Um, and it cost tens of pounds, literally. Um, and this, for us, is um, the essence of the sort of the potential of architecture in a way. Um, and then the, the next day, those, those messages were, were blown up into, uh, onto yellow banners to sort of broadcast those messages to a, to a greater extent. But it was, the, it was the point of sort of the, the provoking of conversation that really mattered. And sometimes those conversations were really, really short. They were sort of momentary where, where people would see each other and say hello. Um, but in many ways, that was the, it was the, the beginning of something. So it is the, the point being that it is the sort of the spark of connection to come for, for, many, of those, for many of those people. Um, I'm sorry you couldn't hear the sound on the video. The video was, uh, needless to say, much better than me sort of briefly talking you through it. Now, the question is, how do I move on to the next slide without? Um, all right, talk amongst yourselves, as it were, technical issue. Ah, there we are. Right, so this one, um, I'm starting with the Dulwich Pavilion, a project that you will probably all be aware of to, to some extent, just because this, this is a device um, following on from uh, that, that yellow balloon installation, not that it followed chronologically, but it was doing something very, very similar uh, in terms of uh, the social effect that we wanted it to have. 
Um, so the Dulwich Pavilion, as many of you may know, was designed by Sir John Soane. It was the first purpose-built public art gallery in the world. Um, John, uh, Sir John Soane's architecture is um, extraordinary, as, as you will undoubtedly know, and there's an awful lot of play of light and mirrors and spatial effects in his work. And um, here you see the John Soane Museum, which I hope all of you know. If you haven't been, please please go when it, re when it reopens. Um, but the, it was located at the Dulwich Picture Gallery, which uh, has this beautiful landscape and a very um, austere uh, building from the outside. And really what we wanted to do was to try to interplay those two things so in a way to, to bring the, the landscape and the architecture together um, and to, to merge them and overlay one, one onto, onto the other. And it began um, with us sort of working through a series of sketches as, as these things often do. And, and it was around the idea of um, canopies and really thinking about the idea of trees, but also thinking about the, the nature of the architecture and the formality of that gallery building. So we created something, we created uh, 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 an elevation, a form that was very formal. And a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of what you can see here in terms of the horizontal elements um, aligned with many of those in the gallery building. So you can see the roof aligned with the, um, the, the eaves of the gallery, the plinth aligned with the plinth of uh, the gallery building behind. Um, and the trust roof referred to uh, the, the, the lanterns that sit on top of the gallery, which you can see here. Um, and here are a couple of the initial uh, competition renderings, and you can see it in the landscape here. And one of the key things for this was to create a series of mirrored panels that would uh, be, be movable, be relocatable within that space. So you can see uh, on this level, all of these panels um, could be reconfigured and rearranged. And so you can start to see here in the, in the visualization and then the realization of that, that overlay of landscape and building that I was talking about. And to, to create that effect required um, some very careful detailed design um, in terms of the, the trusses and the structure and those connections, um, because that meant that when you've got a moment like this, where you've got the mirror intersecting with, with the truss, you get this continuity of roof and of sight line, so that really you are, um, you're blurring reality um, and reflection. And the most important thing of, for this was really to create a space where people would come together, um, as you see here. So it was this idea of creating a, a very sociable space um, and a space that would transform sort of night to day. And there were various activities that took place there. This was Florence from Florence and the Machine singing at their summer party. But more importantly than that were the, the numerous um, sort of public events that took place, whether that was yoga, um, baby yoga, uh, dancing, or, or, or art classes, or various others. It was a place for people to come together and interact, um, and school events and various others that took place there. Um, and in fact, this is a group of school children from the local primary school um, where the uh, pavilion um, was going to be relocated to become their sort of permanent covered play area in, in the school. Um, the second project I want to show you is a competition submission we did for the Manchester um, Memorial. Uh, we, this was one that we sadly didn't win, it happens occasionally, um, but we were one of three shortlisted practices. Um, the memorial was for the, the, the victims of the Manchester Arena bombing um, that took place on the 22nd of May 2017, um, 22 victims. Um, an extraordinary uh, outpouring of grief that I'm sure you will all remember. And it was a, a concert for Ariana Grande, and there were victims that had come from all over the north of England to this event. And you can see here in terms of the, the dots on the map where, where uh, those individuals came from. And when we began looking at this to create a space for all of these victims' families and all of these uh, sort of victims' friends and the, and the wider Manchester community to come together, we really wanted to refer to those origins, those places of origin, those, the, the homes of those people. 
And so we began really with a, a compass from Manchester, pointing out to all of those different locations, Leeds, York, Sheffield, Stockport, etc. cetera. Um, and they became uh, then associated with the, with the names of the victims who had come from those places. And from there, we aligned all of those um, individuals in, in the order sort of geographically uh, to where they came, came from to create this circular form that, that connected them in infinity. And the circle is a really important geometrical element in that it is the infinite, um, it's the whole, it refers to the halo, it has religious symbolism and, and various other reasons. So the circle as a form is, is one that we felt was very, very appropriate um, to this particular brief and this particular challenge. And so that circular form turned into this uh, circular plan, a, a stone path and a series of stone benches that wrapped around. And then sitting on top of that was a, uh, a polished steel roof that was this continuous ribbon. And the idea is that this would be held aloft by 22 columns. Um, and it was raised up a bit like a children's game of... Um, uh, a children's parachute game that you can see in the top left corner. Um, and you can see from the, the, the concept model on, on the right that from certain angles, it would also be seen as a, an infinity symbol. So it was a form that, that lifted up and dropped down. And in a way it was um, referencing this idea of a dance. And this idea of movement, uh, a dance and playfulness was really important because that, what, that is what linked all of those victims who had come together for, for the, the, the concert. And so here you see that expressed um, in, in the location next to Manchester Cathedral. We were collaborating with uh, the Manchester poet Lem Sisse for this project. And this poem was to be engraved uh, around the, the, the circle um, on the inside. And it felt very, very appropriate to, uh, to the bombing and to the, the resolve of, of the city and, and everyone who was involved in it. Um, said the sun to the moon, said the head to the heart, we have more in common than sets us apart. And so that poem was to be uh, engraved around the edge of this central um, garden that you can see in the middle there. And around that was to be another ribbon of water um, that was effectively a, a, a trough of water, a continuous flowing element that would capture all of the rain that was coming off the roof. Uh, to create this very reflective space, um, this intimate space, this protected space um, that would be somewhere for uh, the families uh, and friends of the victims and everyone who is associated with it to, to come and spend time. And so the design did three things. It was a place for, sort of from left to right, a place to gather um, for the memorial every year itself. Um, a place to remember in the middle for, for the victims or friends of those families. So each, each stone would have uh, the name of the victim on it. So it would be a place to come and lay flowers or light candles, etc. And then finally, on the right-hand side, it was intended to be a place of reflection. Um, and that could be for individual, uh, individuals to come and reflect whether, whether they, they knew victims or not. It was just to be a, a place of individual reflection and contemplation. And so you can see this, this circular form sitting in the plan uh, here with, with entrances from, from two sides. And then here you start to see this idea of the, the engraving and the messaging. So from the center, you have the poem. Um, on the inside, you get the names of the individual victims um, and sort of 22 uh, elements as you go around the circle. And then on the entrances engraved into the floor would have been the, the, the story of that um, event, uh, sort of explaining what the space was. And so here you see it in section, um, that roof really sort of floating above the, the stone. And it's therefore composed of these four, um, effectively four elements. So from bottom to top, you've got this stone circle of remembrance with the 22 engraved names. You've got this central island and the water that runs around it as, as an element of reflection. 22 columns that represent each of those 22 victims. And then finally, the roof is a, a dancing form that is uh, an element of celebration. So celebrating the lives lived and, and the happy memories. Um, and so here you see it set within that, um, that wider context.
So this is very different. This is a school project in, in Surrey. Um, but this, again, talking about that idea of uh, creating sort of social spaces, that was, was very much at the, the heart of, of this brief. So um, as you can see from this image, the school is in a pretty extraordinary place. It's up in the Surrey Hills, um, an area of outstanding natural beauty, um, incredibly green, uh, beautiful uh, views out over, over farmland and woodland. But this is a view from the main teaching um, sort of street, as it were, within, within the school. And other than a, a, a sort of slightly forlorn fir tree in the distance, there are no views out. And this is very consistent, actually, with, with how the, the school is experienced in the center. Um, it was an old convent school, and the, the nuns over the course of the 20th century just built what they needed where they needed it. There was very little consideration for, for aesthetics or, or the quality of the space that was being created. And so our first move was to develop a master plan for the school. And we started by looking at the, the plans of some of the Oxbridge um, colleges um, and this sort of this collegiate tradition of creating green um, courtyards, green quads within these learning environments. And so the, clearly the, the environment we had within the school was not um, uh, as, uh, as beautiful as any Ox Oxford or Cambridge college but it was still something that we could uh, aspire to. And we did that really by going through the, the buildings, analyzing the buildings um, in terms of their quality and starting to determine what uh, should come down, what should be replaced and what should be preserved. And then through that, creating these sort of main connections, uh, both the existing and new ones, and then starting to define where um, new buildings could be built. Um, but based around a series of new uh, courtyards, new green spaces that would start to define those areas. And that, um, that was really about creating these courtyards that, that could be um, sort of planted green, uh, whether for various different activities uh, or, or trees, orchards, etc., whatever that might be. And so when it came to the design of the, the sixth form centre, which is the first part of, of the master plan, we really wanted to look at um, creating a space that had a, um, uh, a, a university-like experience to it. So it really is that um, transition stage for the students going through their school experience, sort of going from 16-year-olds um, to the sixth form, um, and then uh, likely moving on to, to university and just giving them that, that start in, in terms of uh, what university might be like within that um, school setting. And again, we looked back at uh, sort of Oxbridge colleges, looking at how those courtyards worked, looking at um, the porter's lodges and, and the gates, uh, such as this one that you get when you enter, enter into those spaces. Um, this plan and the, the sort of circle at the top left there shows two existing porter cabins, which was the, the site for the new, um, the new sick form center. And it was a relatively, um, well, very underutilized quarter of the site. Um, there's a wonderful woodland to the, to the north there, which is part of the school grounds, which really wasn't used. And there are various amazing green views that you get through that. And it was really those connections that we, we wanted to harness. And so this was an initial sketch um, showing an early concept, this idea of creating something um, and almost a beacon for the sixth form that would sit there but also creating those connections through, through to the woodland and, and various other spaces. So just as a series of very simple diagrams, these are the two uh, port cabins that existed previously. And this was the sort of proposed volume, the proposed mass of the new building. And the, the reason for this configuration was uh, driven to a large extent by, by finances, um, but also by environmental considerations and, and those wider moves. The block on the left-hand side with the, the classrooms in was based on the, the more cellular spaces. So the classrooms, the library, um, and the common room uh, that could be constructed in a relatively modular way, in a sort of prefabricated off-site way, um, really to, to maximize construction efficiency. And then the red block on the right-hand side was the lecture theater, which obviously is a larger space 
required a different form of construction, um, a, probably a portal frame was the assumption at the outset, it became a timber portal frame. But understanding the, the different construction requirements, the different spatial requirements for those elements enabled us to split those uh, volumes into two different buildings and therefore save money and save time in their construction. And those two elements were, were linked by this, this bridge uh, to create connection at first floor. Um, and between them was this open space that allowed this um, both physical and visual connection between two courtyards and also the views to the woodland um, from the, the lecture theatre on the right hand side. And so that's what you see in, in the ground floor plan here. On the right hand side is the woodland and then on the left hand side is the new, um, the new sit film quad that was created um, uh, by framing these two existing buildings uh, to the left and, and the south. And so in the block on the top, you get the four classrooms and office and the, and the common room, and then the lecture theater in the block below. And so that is, is largely repeated on top. And so here you have this space that is defined by this colonnade, um, creating external circulation, meaning that people are moving around outside. Um, and here you have that view through to the woodland in the distance. So you get this, this connection between these two spaces. And it's the space in between those two blocks that in a, in a way is the most important part of the new building, the most important space. It's this uh, social space that is that sort of circles around this newly planted tree that sits in the middle of the, the plan. And so here you can see in the section that um, the, the raised section with the, the main staircase um, and the tree on the right hand side. But this covered external space becomes the main sort of social focus for that space. So you get all of, everyone moves through that space, whether you're going to the common room, the reading room, a classroom, a lecture theater, et cetera, everyone is, is moving through that space. Um, and that is what you see here. And the, the opening above the tree means that you also get this amazing play of light through the course of the day. Um, that also changes over the course of the year and through this sort of through the seasons and through di through different weathers. Um, and here you have that that view uh, back to the sixth form quad in the in the other direction. And then on the first floor, the this is the main study room. You see that view out to the um, the woodland through a big window to the north. And this was really about creating an environment that was quite tranquil, um, quite calm, um, and that supported people's ability to sort of study and focus and, and to sort of reduce stress levels. So it was fundamentally a, a, a social space, but one that really maximized um, all of those opportunities that the, the site gave it. So the, the next, um, one I'm going to show you is a project called The Space. Um, it is a community centre up in North London. Um, and this is a project that was commissioned by the, the Methodist Church. And as you can see here, the site, um, the site is this building in the centre. Um, it's bounded to the west by a dual carriageway. It's the A10. It's one of the main roads into London from the north. Um, it's a very busy road. And then to the south, there is this, uh, this park, um, which is uh, the only park for, for this estate. Um, and you can see here that the, the estate is really bounded on, on two sides, both to the east and the west, by that dual carriageway um, on the left-hand side, on the western side, and by a railway, which is the red line uh, on, on the right-hand side. And so the estate, in a way, was quite cut off um, from uh, a lot of other facilities and services. Um, this point here at the south is the only point of connection in or out. It was a relatively um, underserved estate. There are many um, challenges that it, that it faces. Um, these are just a few of the photographs to give you a sense of, of what it's like. It's a 1950s estate, quite low rise, um, very uh, sort of very brick in terms of the construction. Um, but quite green in, in that setting, and that is based on that, that connection out to, uh, to the park, to the south of the building. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the existing church building, which is a, a 1950s, um, a very simply built 1950s uh, sort of church hall with an asbestos roof uh, that really was no longer fit for purpose um, and had not been for quite a long time. Um, 
these maps just show, I include these to, to show the, the nature of the area in terms of its demographics and its needs. So the, the site is the little white dot that you can see on all six of them. Um, and it's uh, a site that is um, deprived on by, by many measures. So uh, quite low levels of uh, education skills, very high levels of unemployment, um, and quite a lot of people that don't speak English. So there are um, various challenges that we were trying to address through the brief. Um, and the client was, was very keen um, that we would um, uh, sort of support the community through. When we began the project, we were looking at um, various examples from uh, all over the world. So this one, you, you may know, this is a project called Absalom in Copenhagen. Um, and it's a, a former church, uh, and it has been created into this extraordinary sort of community center. And they have, you can look it up online and you can find the, the, the Absalom website, but they have these incredible community dinners every single day. Um, and they are relatively affordable dinners. Um, they're designed so that basically anyone can come along and can join. And they're, they're, they're just very, very convivial. And that was the, the essence of the, the sort of type of space that the, the client wanted. And that also sort of reminded us of projects like this. This is a, a, a common house in a co-housing development um, called Lang Eng, um, again in Norway. Um, but I include this just to talk about this idea of shared meals uh, and the sharing of food as a really important um, aspect in terms of bonding and people coming together. It's one of those sort of frequent and, and recurring events uh, that people connect over. And so as part of the process of developing the project, uh, we began with, um, with a, a whole host of community engagement events. And the community engagement involved sort of pop-ups at local bus stops outside the school, outside the news agents, flyering literally hundreds and hundreds of houses. But it came to a uh, sort of pinnacle in the, in the summer with this um, festival, this, this big summer party that we put on to really bring the whole community together, to enable neighbors to talk to each other and meet each other who perhaps hadn't met before, to share their ideas for what this project could be, and really to get them to feel a sense of ownership over that building and what, what the building um, sort of would be when it, when it arrived. And so you can see here in these series of photos that it really was about that idea of sort of food and sitting together around a table. Um, and people came, people came from all over the place and, and there was music and games and various others. And you can just about see me in the background there, but we, we were um, literally doing the limbo with the community and hoopla and various other things. And so it was about um, connecting with uh, people in a way that really gathers, gains a sense of trust. So we wanted to make sure that they would um, trust us to deliver a building that really served them and also trust us so that they could tell us what they wanted and what they needed. And so there were um, uh, sort of, this is our um, mobile sort of conversation table that really went around the community in various different ways. And you can see some of the very, very early sketches, very early drawings of the ideas in the middle there. Um, but on the right-hand side, you can see the flyers where, where we were asking people what they wanted, um, what they wanted the space to contain, uh, what sort of events, what sort of activities, et cetera. And so this is one of those very early sketches that was put up on the board. And this really speaks to that idea of a, a community cafe space, a community kitchen that was so central to the original brief. Um, the client, as I said, was the Methodist church. Um, the building is not going to be a church. It's going to have uh, a very, very, very small uh, religious element because uh, effectively the congregation had dwindled to very few people, so it was no longer viable. Um, but the church wanted it to be uh, really a multifunctional, flexible space. So it's got um, a large, uh, uh, it's got a preschool, um, it's got a cafe, and it's got a large auditorium space that for, sort of serves a, a multitude of uses from uh, a nativity play uh, to yoga to sort of uh, arts and crafts clubs for, for elder people, et cetera. 
And so here you can see a few of our very early sketches for the project. Um, and this one I think is quite important in that it talks about the, the nature of the building in relation to its context. So you will remember that we have the, the A10 dual carriageway down one side and the, the park to the other. Um, and this speaks to that idea of the building having a, a back and a front and the back of the building being quite defensive, um, literally a, a physical, um, visual and acoustic barrier to that dual carriageway. And then something that's much more open on the other side with views out to the park um, that is actually oriented around uh, a tree that is in the, the sort of center of that, uh, the site at the middle that they wanted to, to preserve um, as, a, as an important feature. And this one talks about uh, the, the types of sort of spaces that we were creating to start to shape opportunities for connection and conversation. So the two green shaded areas there are the, the sort of two uh, entrances on either side. I, I hesitate to use the word sort of front and back entrance because they're, they're both equally important. And, and both of them were treated in the same way in that they were um, recessed with, with benches that were set into that covered area to enable people to come along, sit down, have a conversation, um, and effectively provide that place of uh, external shelter that was part of that building and provide a bench for uh, an old man or a sort of young woman to, to come and uh, sit down and have a conversation and just meet their neighbors um, and, and talk. And so this model as one of the sort of early concept models shows that idea of the, the sort of solid back and the open front. So you can just about on either side there see this um, cardboard element that wrapped around that forms that back aspect to it. And the two, the, the double story element obviously sloping down on the right hand side was that uh, sort of physical and acoustic barrier to the road. And then on the inside face around the, the tree that I mentioned, it comes down to a much, um, uh, a much lower level. It comes down to the sort of single story eaves, really to create that more intimate human scaled central space. And that is what you can see in this, in this sketch here. Um, the church building in this sketch was, was maintained. Um, the, the whole building has been designed so that the original church hall can be, can be kept in the first phase, um, really to ensure that all of the activities and community groups that use it are not um, kicked out over the, the year of construction. And the reason that was really important is that we didn't want um, any of those groups to lose momentum. So if any of them were going to be sort of moved out or uh, sort of relocated from the, the church hall, there was a very strong chance that they just would, would fall apart and those groups would disappear. And, and all of that sense of community bonding and connection and cohesion that we worked so hard to develop through the engagement process, there was a risk that would be lost. So it was really important that that building was maintained or will be maintained through the course of construction so that everyone who uses it um, will be able to sort of decant um, in, a, in a single move from that building to the new building once it is built. And then only after that will the existing church um, building be demolished. And so here you see that view from, from the other side, which is the uh, dual carriageway side, really showing that, that defensive um, wall uh, to the to the north, but with clear story glazing, clerestory glazing, um, all the way along the upper level uh, to ensure that we've got light coming from both sides. And this this photo shows a really important part of the process. So this is our client uh, Kathleen on the left hand side, but also other members of the community uh, came to these events really to create a community steering group. And that steering group came out of the engagement process by taking the names of people who were really excited, really interested, really keen to be involved, um, to create a committee that would help support the development of the project. And the aim is that that group will then go on to uh, sort of support the operation of the building once it is built. So the hope from, from the client, from the church, is that they will effectively be able to hand over the operation of the building to a, um, a committee of 
people that, that live uh, on the estate itself so that the community will be running it for themselves. And so here you have um, a, a, general, uh, a general diagram showing the various different spaces in the building um, with the nursery on the ground floor and the cafe on the ground floor and then the, uh, the, the, the hall on the upper level. Um, here are the plans, which are probably easier to look through. So you have the, um, let me just talk you through them briefly. This is the nursery on the, the left-hand side here. Uh, which spills out to this undercovered area here, which will become the, the sort of sheltered external play area. That's designed to be uh, openable um, when necessary, so that the entire ground floor can be, can be connected into the cafe space on the right-hand side here. And that cafe space itself is designed to connect out to um, some sort of community uh, growing on the other side, outside the kitchen really to create this sense of multiple activities going on. And there will be a, a, a new sort of garden shed, as it were, that goes in to support a men in sheds program that some of you may have come across that really is about creating these opportunities for uh, connection and um, sort of interaction um, across multiple different ages. And so the section through that entrance is shown here, and you really get a sense of that tall um, facade along the, the dual carriageway side. And then this sort of quite dynamic undercroft of roof that reaches up um, into the cafe space on the, on the left-hand side. And this is that view through from, from one of the entrances. Uh, the park is actually out the door on the, the right-hand side, um, and then the cafe is up ahead. And this really gives a sense of the, the type of space that we want it to be. Um, so it is really sort of for everyone. So everyone from every age, um, whoever they might be in the community, whether they uh, are sort of native uh, English or whether they are sort of relatively new immigrants, everyone will be welcome in this space. Um, and the other important thing that you, you see in this image is the, the timber. So this has been designed to be constructed of CLT. Um, it has been designed to be um, almost entirely timber in its structure. Uh, we have reduced steel elements wherever we possibly can. Um, the exterior is clad with brick to make it uh, sort of fit into that local context, but it is timber that really under, underpins this project. Um, this is a short section in the other direction. So the, this door here where this woman is, uh, uh, or this parent rather, is going in with a buggy is that door that you see uh, just here on the right-hand side. But what this section shows is the relationship between the nursery on the ground floor and the hall above. And you can see this opening and the, the sort of roof lights here to create this sort of dynamic light effect to the nursery. And then the hall above is lit almost entirely by the clerestory windows uh, to the north. And so here is the, the nursery on the ground floor with the light um, and the higher ceiling on the right-hand side. And then the, oh, I was going to show you the hall. No, here is the first floor plan. Yes, so you have the, the hall on the left-hand side. And this also has uh, an IT suite and an after-school club room. Um, and then a very small prayer room, which is uh, the, the, the remnants of what was the church. So the church group will use, will use that space. Um, so here is a visualization of that hall space up on, up on the first floor. Um, and this is the, the external view from the park. Um, one of the first things that we did when we uh, met the client for the first time was to tell them to cut down a very tall uh, and very oppressive hedge that ran all the way around the site. And that hedge uh, would probably come up to about this height. Um, and that hedge completely disconnected the site from the park. And it meant that no one really could, could see the building that was already there. No one really could see the church that was already there. So actually, one of the most important things for us to do is to make the most of that connection to the park, both to, to benefit this new community center, but also to benefit the park so that collectively um, they will see greater use um, and greater community involvement of both of them. But one of the, the things I really want to point out here is the, the, the painting on the walls on these corners. So uh, the building is brick, but we are... Um, very much intending for these corner elements to be uh, painted over. So there will be sort of pieces of uh, painted brickwork on the ground floor 
that will be designed for um, drawing on by children for graffiti, et cetera. And one of the reasons that came about really connects directly back to the engagement process where at that summer party that I showed you the photos of, um, there were kids there with chalk that were drawing all over the floor and drawing all over the building. And of course, at the point that the, the client had decided the building was no longer going to be a church and was going to be demolished, they weren't very precious about it. And they saw the joy that the kids were having from drawing on these walls. And Kathleen, our client, was like, we, we must sort of maintain this. This is fantastic. We really must see this in the, in the new building. So that was one of the things that came out of that engagement process that really led um, very directly into the brief for the new building um, and will be there as a result of, uh, of, of that engagement process and, and that party. This is actually the, the last project that I will show you. I'm making reasonably good time. Um, so this, this is a project for Southwark Council. Um, it's in Rotherhithe in Southeast London. And you, you can see its relationship to, uh, to the River Thames there. It's not too far away, although it feels quite, quite disconnected from it in reality. Um, and this, as you will probably see from this photo, is quite a, it's quite a tricky site. Um, it's got two very large retaining walls um, that are abutting two pieces of key transport infrastructure. So on the, the bottom of the image, this is uh, a road going to uh, a tunnel called the Rotherhithe Tunnel. That's one of the key tunnels under the River Thames. And then where you have these steps, they are actually an access uh, or uh, an escape route from the, the London Overground um, Tunnel that connects to this railway station here, which is the Rotherhithe, Rotherhithe station, and then goes out this way to, to go under the River Thames. And so you have this, uh, these two key, key pieces of transport infrastructure on two sides of the site, which has led to um, some very sensitive negotiations with, with Transport for London that is responsible for, for these retained walls, but has also led to um, some quite careful design process for what we're creating. Um, it's a very historic uh, site. It's a very historic area. Um, it used to have an awful lot of docklands. Um, and it has quite a legacy uh, as a result of that. There's a very large Scandinavian com community in the area um, that is, is there directly as a result of, of the docks and, and the merchants and the traders that, that used to be there. Um, and here you can see the site uh, in the center of the image here, sitting on Albion Street directly. Um, and then here is the, the train station that I mentioned, and that is the connection to the north. And one of the, the important things to, to point out on this that uh, you will see in the design later are sort of two key connections. So this route on this side leads up to the, the Thames River path. There's another footpath here that connects to the, to the river. And then staggered on the other side, this road leads down, and you can get through this block here to, to an estate called, uh, to an area called Canada Water that has been um, uh, hugely invested in. Um, and there's a, there's a very, very large redevelopment, regeneration of that area going, going on at the moment. And so the site is kind of connected or, or stuck between this, this river walkway to the north and Canada water to the south, um, both of which attract a lot of people. Um, and Albion Street is sort of stuck between them as a street that, that doesn't attract very many people. Um, and when we began the project, the, we were, we've been appointed twice by the council for this, initially for the, for the feasibility and the, the, the business planning, and then later for the architectural development. But the first time around, our brief was uh, simply to go out and talk to the community and find out what they wanted on this site. Um, and it was through a, a series of engagement events here with the, the council, but also pop-up markets and various things like that to understand what, what people wanted and lots of uh, sort of post-it notes, post-it notes everywhere. Um, and you can see here some of the, some of the responses. So we talked about uh, Canada Water and the impact of the Canada Water development. So it's seen as, as very positive. It brings a lot of investment to the area, but over a third saw it as, as negative, which was an important thing to, for us to consider. And then on the right-hand side, the appearance of, uh, of Albion Street, uh, most local people were sort of saw it as, as very, very negative. So this building, uh, a project by the council, was really an opportunity to create a, a landmark on that street 
that really sort of uplifted um, the visual appearance and people's general sense of the, the quality of that street. Um, this is quite a dry but a really important chart that talks about um, the types of spaces, the types of program that people wanted to see there. Um, and it was this chart that, that defines the brief. So you can see at the top, um, this is sort of providing food and beverage opportunities, the, a very, very low percentage of positive response and a very large percentage of, of negative response. And the reason for this is that any new uh, sort of cafes or, or, or spaces like that would be seen as competitors to some of the existing businesses on the street. And that was really not something that um, local people wanted um, because they, they knew that those businesses uh, were not uh, necessarily thriving as it was and additional competition would, would be very difficult for them. Whereas at the very bottom of the table, uh, workspace, uh, startup space, studio space, um, were seen very positively. And this came through in all of the interviews and, and various other sort of uh, engagement activities which took place, that the local community wanted um, uh, small units where local startups, local entrepreneurs, local people could find affordable workspace. And it was that, um, and it was the outcome of this process that really defined the, the brief of the project. And so here is, here is the site with that, um, uh, the tunnel running uh, sort of left to right above and the, uh, the railway tunnel uh, on this side. And as you can see from this photo, there were a series of houses, three terraced houses on the site previously. Um, they uh, were demolished for structural reasons, um, but the site is still earmarked as a, a housing site by Sovex, so it's a, uh, an affordable housing site. And any uh, proposal that wasn't affordable housing was very, uh, very negatively um, viewed by all of the local residents. And so it was for this reason that this project is a, is a meanwhile project. So while it's a new build, it's only being, uh, it's being designed to only be there for about 11 years, 11 or 12 years. Um, and the, the building will then be relocated elsewhere. But the reason for that is that the council wanted uh, a meanwhile use as a way of uh, convincing uh, local people that this was something positive that they should support because it remains a housing site. That is, it's a sort of long-term, uh, the long-term intention of the council is that it will, will return to housing. But in the meanwhile, um, they wanted it to deliver some sort of other positive benefit to local people. And so this plan shows the, the footprint of those houses. And this is important because when those houses were demolished, um, they didn't grub out the, the slab. They didn't remove the, the foundations from it. Um, they only demolished from, from grade up, from ground level up. And that means that those foundations are still there um, and we are going to be reusing them. Um, so we have designed the, the space to, to sit on those foundations. And that means that there's very little new concrete that is going into the building as a, as a result. And the building I can show here through a series of sketches was sort of conceived as this um, very simple rectangular form, but with a cruciform element in the middle and a connection north-south that was designed to, to link the street to the, the sort of community yard garden at the back of the site that we're creating. Um, and you can see through this series of sketches that central space is sort of seen as somewhere where you can sort of put a very long table. Um, there's, a, there's a kitchen in there, there are toilets in there. That would be the gathering space for everyone who uses this building, but potentially also for other members of the community as well. There might be sort of summer parties or sort of winter, sort of Christmas um, markets, things like that that might, that might take place there. And so you see in this, um, in this sketch here, that idea of that central space and the, and the various other units around it. And this and the, the final plan really starts to show this, um, the development of this plan in a very geometric way. So it has been designed as uh, almost 15 uh, perfect circles with the central five um, in that cruciform joined together um, to form this uh, sort of 
uh, this central space that provides all of the, the common services for that building. So as a sort of meeting space, toilets, kitchenette, etc., all of them take place within that cruciform. And then around them, you have uh, 10 other spaces that are only six square meters each. They're each very, very small. So they're effectively designed as um, single person studios. But each of those has a direct connection to the outdoors. Um, whether along the, the street to the, the south, um, the sort of pedestrianized route uh, to the east or the, the sort of yard to the north, each of them has a direct link to the outside. Um, and so this very geometric plan um, starts to form this, uh, this community of, of workers, of, of uh, entrepreneurs that are all based around this sort of cruciform and the garden to the rear. And then you can see the, the staircase to the north then leads up to a first floor where there are two anchor units, two slightly larger units, um, 60 square meters and 40 square meters. It's a very small building. Um, and these, these units are for, for larger, larger businesses, more established businesses. Um, we were actually looking at taking the, the larger of these units for a while, although we have, we have since out, outgrown it. Um, uh, unfortunate in that it means we can't move into the building, but fortunate for obvious other reasons. Um, in terms of the architecture, we took a lot of inspiration from uh, the history of the area. You'll remember at the beginning I was talking about um, the, the docks and the, the history of those docks. And this is one of those local photos and looking at the, the language of the, the warehouses and the materials of those warehouses back in the day. And really, you see this in the, the photo, in this photo from the early 20th century. And so the, the language of that roofscape and the materiality is something that we wanted to, to play with um, in a way to reflect back that, that past. And so here in this axonometric, you start to see that architectural expression um, and how it sits on that floor, that ground floor plan of those sort of 15 square um, bays. And also, you will hopefully remember the, the original map of the area and those two key connections and the slight offset uh, of each. And one of the key drivers for the project, for the community, was to try to increase footfall, try to increase the number of people who were coming onto Albion Street. And how we do that through the architecture is almost to use the architecture as a, as a beacon, um, as a signpost. So we have these two, uh, what we call uh, sort of flaps or ears, uh, where we have the, the sort of roof raises on, on two corners with these two big windows. And the reason they're pointing in this direction is that on this side, um, up this gap, sort of through this gap, this is the route through to the river and the river walk. So when you're coming down in this direction or when you look down in this direction, you will see this, um, this beacon, this uh, sort of lantern on this side. And then at the other end, this one, um, similarly, symmetrically, um, is oriented to, to face down this road here, which leads down to uh, Canada Water. So the architecture is designed really as a sort of to, as, as a key pivot um, for Albion Street, pulling people in from these two different directions. And so here in this short section through the building, through this uh, lantern at the uh, at the western end. You see the, the sort of small units on the ground floor, including Mies, somewhat improbably sitting there um, at his drawing board, and the larger unit sort of sitting above. And in the, in the section through the, the street, what we're also doing, because of the setback that resulted, um, because of the, the sort of the, the foundations that we're using from the buildings that were, that, that were there previously, we've got this space that we are able to use for planters and benches um, really as a to create yet another social space on the street. And importantly, the, the local school is sort of di diagonally across. So this is the local school here. And this uh, pullback, this sort of more gen generous um, area of public realm has been designed with these benches in so that parents, when they arrive and sort of are waiting for their kids or parents with their, with their kids and their friends can sit in that space and talk to each other. So it is yet another means of effectively providing that place of, of connection. Um, and then on the left-hand side is the, the sort of community yard space um, where we are hoping that sort of, uh, sort of it, there will be a, a relationship with 
um, a local charity that will come in and, and plant a community garden that can then become part of a process of sort of educating local children about food and growing and cooking. Um, finally, to go to go back to the the, the architectural expression on the outside, um, we were looking at not just at the the history of the the docks and the forms, but also at the the local materials, the local colours. And one of the things that comes out when you walk around these areas is uh, sort of in a way, two two really important different colors. One is one is the reds and the oranges. Um, you see that in the brick. You see that in this um, the pink granite of the bridge that goes over the Rotherhithe Tunnel. This is a, a listed bridge that that is directly adjacent to the site. Um, but also the sort of teal and turquoise colors that come through uh, sort of rusting copper um, that you see in various different uh, oxidizing copper that you see in various different places. And so it's that combination of those two colors that, that really defines the, the palette for the exterior of the building. And so we are, um, the current proposal, what we're currently working through with the contractor is to get uh, timber cladding that will be stained green from a, a light color at the base through to a darker, um, a darker green at the top with these highlights in red all the way around, including sort of the Albion uh, signage that, that goes directly onto the street. And also the pink that will then follow in, in terms of that um, urban realm in front of it. And that pink di connects directly back to the, you can just about see the corner of that listed bridge, or that pink granite bridge on the right hand side there. And so this is the, this is the view from, from the front of the building. And this really is, um, I think, expresses the, the purpose of this project really well in that it shows the connection through from the street to that new community yard space at the back through the center, but also the, the makers that hopefully will occupy these smaller units on the, on the ground level, um, as well as those that will occupy the, the larger units at the top. Um, but it is now seven minutes past. I've gone, I've gone slightly over, but there we are. Um, I hope that was interesting. I will stop sharing now so we can go into some Q&A. So thank you very much, Thomas, for this lovely lecture. It was really thorough and really well put together. And uh, just to kind of start things off, if people have any questions, please put them into the chat. And just to start these things off, I was going to ask you, so I've seen that you have a really um, good way of approaching and engaging with the community. Mm -hmm. And um, how, do you, how do you still do that during these COVID times? That's a that's a very very good question. Um, it's so we have we have another project that I I didn't include um, that I could have done down in down in Hastings called the Observer Building um, that some of you might have seen on our on our website. Um, the Observer Building is a it's a really interesting project in that it's a uh, the the building is the old office and print works for the the local newspaper and it was abandoned in 1985 when they moved out and it's been vacant ever since. And that building has gone through um, sort of many decades of uh, community involvement and community campaigning to try and save it. Um, and we were going through a process of, uh, we've got planning permission for the building. Uh, phase one is about to start, um, slightly delayed. But last summer, um, so the summer of 2020, was meant to be the real launch for, for that building, for the programming um, sort of a whole host of uh, community activities and events that were going to take place there. Obviously, the summer of 2020 um, was a bit disastrous for, for that sort of thing, for obvious reasons. Um, and so one of the things that, that we did and the community did was to set up a new um, online TV station on um, Facebook called uh, Isolation Station Hastings. And we used that that online TV channel to go through, um, sort of to connect with the community in various different ways. So they had various arts events, they had um, performances, they had sort of plays, all sorts of things, yoga, et cetera, on there. And we did a lot of our community consultation through that. Um, and that enabled sort of in, in a similar way to, to, to this, it enabled us to present the project and to talk directly to people um, in the community. And actually what it also does is that it means that 
in a way you're, you're democratizing it even more because people who may not have had the time uh, to go to the building in that moment or may not have had the, the sort of ability if they were old or frail or, or young with sort of very young children. Um, in a way, it, it enables more people to experience that community engagement event. And one of the brilliant things is that it has sort of very live feedback. And so people are able to ask questions in the chat as you're going along, and it's actually much more responsive. So whilst it's not the same as um, sort of having a more traditional meet the architect event, where you'll put your boards up or you'll have a big sort of barbecue sort of festival like the, like the project I showed you, it enables us to adapt and, and do things in a different way. Um, there are also other examples. So. Uh, one of the other projects that we're doing at the moment for Harangay, we've employed two local people, two local young people, I think 19 and 20 years old, um, to sort of lead uh, the community engagement process with uh, people of their age in the local area. And so they have set up their own uh, Instagram account um, and are doing an awful lot of engagement through that. So it's about using social media in some interesting and, and sort of slightly more innovative ways. Effectively, it forces you to be a bit more creative with your with your community engagement than you than we might otherwise be. And I think that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, 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 if nothing else, it, it teaches us, um, uh, it puts a few more tools in our basket for community engagement because we are obviously when when COVID is fingers crossed over, um, we're not going to uh, sort of abandon all of this and suddenly run back to sort of old school engagement. It suddenly means that actually we've got multiple ways of doing things and people will be a lot more comfortable with online events and we'll be able to do those as well as um, sort of physical in person events. Yeah, that's definitely a great plus for us. Mm. Yeah, and it means, I mean, even events like, like this, um, I don't know whether you're all in Sheffield at the moment, but it means that people can actually come to these things from all over the place, wherever they might be. And you've got people that are able to connect from all over the world um, and, and, and come to those events uh, where they are relevant to them. So just the, the ability to connect both sort of geographically um, and and also in terms of accessibility generally, I think it's a very, very good thing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got some questions in the chat, um, which I'll read out one from Delphine. And it says, when starting a short term project, which seems like a rather unusual request, how does the reassembly um, aspect impact the design process? How do you tackle it as an opportunity instead of a hindrance to our architectural design? I assume that is related to, uh, for instance, the Albion Street project, where it's there for a limited period of time. I think that's what she means. If you want to come on and clarify, Delphine. Do you want, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, it's in terms of the Albion Fit project. Um, Great. Albion okay. Street, yeah. Okay. Um, it is. It is an un well. I say it's an unusual request. We're about to. Um, we're on the shortlist for a new project. Um, in Newham in Northeast London, which is also a temporary uh, sort of low cost community workspace project. And that one um, is for an even shorter period. So that might be five or six years, but again, designed to be relocated. So it's, it's an unusual request, um, but it's something that I think more councils are becoming aware is a real sort of opportunity. So meanwhile use, um, is something that you will probably all know very well, um, but is not something that has been around uh, sort of in terms of uh, clients' awareness of possibilities for that long. So like the, the meanwhile use of an empty shop, for instance, or, or the meanwhile use of the site before it gets redeveloped, um, that has huge potential in terms of community benefit and sort of local economic benefit, et cetera. But the, the meanwhile use of uh, an empty plot of land, um, particularly somewhere like London, where, where land is really, really precious, um, if, that, if that site is going to be empty for sort of five, 10, 20 years, and they know there is a plan to, redevelop, to re redevelop it further down the line, 
the opportunity to come in and, and create a module that can be sort of moved from one site to the other is, is a really um, powerful one. And it's one that we have actually worked with, with a number of people on and have sort of done a certain amount of um, self-initiated research in terms of designing those units so that they are volumetric units um, so that they could be very easily relocatable. Um, but it's about, um, yeah, it's, it's about creating those, sort of maximizing the opportunities that those sites offer um, without uh, sort of depriving the client or the owner of that longer term aspiration. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, and we also have another question from Natasha. In the loneliness project, you talk about changing people's everyday everyday's experience with balloons. Uh, of where of where they live in order to spark conversations. This is a really exciting approach to start with, and I am curious as to how why did this and similar ideas of yours emerged. Um, hi, Natasha. That is um, so. That project was it's it's part of a. We, well, we worked with an organization called the Loneliness Lab for it. Um, the Loneliness Lab, look it up, loneliness.lab.org, I think. Um, they, it's an amazing organization that was set up with funding from Lendlease, the developer, um, to look at the problem of, of loneliness and social isolation in the built environment. And the reason that it came about, the reason that Lendlease wanted to contribute this money, is that Lendlease, as one of the world's sort of largest residential developers, had done some post-occupancy analysis and, and sort of research with some of their residents to find out what their biggest challenges were. And I think the, the, the sort of managers of Lendlease who were running this had probably anticipated that it might be a sort of physical fitness, sort of something like that, something that they could easily easily resolve through through design techniques. Um, and when it came back and they realised that it was loneliness and isolation. They kind of panicked because it was like, well, what do we what do we do with this? This is really hard. Um, and they they sort of funded this organisation to do a lot of research and to bring together experts from a huge variety of fields, whether it's sort of architects, landscape architects, sociologists, historians, healthcare workers of all sorts, artists, um, to look at this from a, a really holistic view. Um, and that project came about as a as a design sprint, so it was intended to be a very very quick thing, um, as a way of generating um, ideas that could be tested in a very very short period of time. And so that was um, as a as a design team, as a designer, it was kind of terrifying because as architects, we I mean you all know this, we we sit there, we have a brief. We think about what the solution might be, we draw it, and then you go out very intentionally to create it. Whereas actually for that project, it was so short, there wasn't time for that. It's like, okay, go out, this is the site, what do you do? Okay, sort of you test something. You, you go to the shop, you see what the shop has. It's like, what is there? It's like, you've got balloons. Okay, all the balloon, the, the packs of balloons are multiple different colors. And it's like, all right, we don't want multicolors. We only want yellow. Okay, we're gonna have to buy 20 packs and only use sort of a quarter of each of those packs because they've only got a quarter of yellow balloons in each one. Um, and so you go through this process very, very quickly um, to create something that, that you hope might work, but you don't know will work. And so it was making the most of what was available um, and it was thinking on our feet very quickly um, to try to create something that was just a bit provocative and a bit disruptive um, and just a bit joyful, importantly. So it's like that, that was why we went for the yellow. It was like because people came out of that, their front door, which was in the undercroft. And it's like, wow, what's this? Um, and that's when, you, well, that's when you start those conversations. And of course, yeah, those yellow, those balloons could have been white or red or blue. It probably wouldn't have made that much difference. But it was about um, uh, sort of doing something that had, uh, I guess, a static intent, but also social intent. Yeah, 
Um, I think we've got a question from Mimi in the chat. Do you want to unmute yourself, Mimi? Hi, um, me again. Um, I think I might have a question somewhere amongst this, but um, <laughs> a bit more of like a comment. Um, and I guess just situating, um, I'm finishing my part two and I'm also doing management practice and law, so I am in a little bubble. But um, I think it's great for um, many part twos and part ones to see how much involvement and um, presentation you show with regard to your initial sketches and um, slightly more developed sketches and I think often students kind of forget that all of these process drawings and sketches are really important and we should be showing them off so I think it's great that you are so expressive and you're able yeah. to talk about it so much because I often eight bits of line on a piece of paper speak thousands of words um, so thank you for doing that and your other um, models and I think um, also seeing lots of the community involvement um, and that in Sheffield at part two, we, uh, we get involved in live projects. And so we have a client and um, it's quite hard often for a group of students to sort of extrapolate what mm -hmm. the client is telling you. And I think again, for you to be able to show so sophisticatedly and sensitively um, what your client's requirements are um, and to be able to condense that concisely and filter their needs, I think is again, um, sometimes not taking all their comments and picking out the best ones and demonstrating them well, you can still say mm. that you listen to them and um, mm. rather try to incorporate everything. So I think, again, that was um, quite enlightening to see. Um, mm. And uh, moving on to a bit more of your final project, um, I think often maybe having come back out of part one, um, students might feel slightly disillusioned with um, the kind of work that architects do um, and that there's a scope to talk with councils and other people to define a brief, which is what you, we end up doing as students, but then you never get to do anymore. So I think it's kind of, yeah, hopeful that there is more opportunity for that. Um, so I guess this brings back to your initial comment right at the very beginning, um, and just talking about your practice a bit more, and that you've got, that I presume most of the work that you showed us is that 30%, um, and you've got other 30%. So I just wanted to know what sort of makes a successful practice? How do people work on different projects? Um, do you have particular teams? Or um, yeah, if there are many of us wanting to set up our own practice or get involved in practices like your own, which I'm sure lots of people sitting here are sort of are um, thinking in the future that this would be a practice I'd like to be in. Um, just any comments about that, really? Cool, thanks, thanks, Mimi. Um, all right, so I, on, your, on your first point, crap sketches. Yes, please celebrate your crap sketches. I, we, we produce a lot of really bad sketches through the, through the design process. Um, they're really important. Um, never, be, never be ashamed of what you think is a, is a shit sketch. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, particularly, I mean, Zoom, we do, we do an awful lot of our design reviews, obviously, on Zoom these days and have therefore become masters of the Zoom annotations. Um, and that is a way of producing even worse sketches, even crapper sketches, um, which we still celebrate, we still share, because they're, they're really important. Um, on your, your second point about distilling, distilling comments, um, it's, it, that's, it's a really important one. Um, and I think that a big part of it is just making people um, is listening to people, um, particularly when it's community engagement, um, making people understand that their opinions and their views matter and that we want to hear from them and that they have agency over their area and they have agency over the places in which they live and they have agency over sort of the future of, of the development of that area. It's, that's really important. Um, but yes, inevitably, there's going to be a lot of distilling. I remember on the, the Hastings project that I should have showed you in hindsight, some of the comments we got on that were like a, 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 bowling, a bowling alley and a swimming pool in the basement and a helipad on the roof um, from a six-year-old. And of course, that's where it's like, oh, brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, further down the line, it's like probably less practical. Um, but on your... Um, uh, yeah, on, on, your, on your question about what makes a successful practice, uh, I'm still working that out. <laughs> uh, 
the, the third, third, third thing, that is um, we have found that that works for us reasonably well. I think it keeps us, it keeps us happy. Um, it keeps us interested in what we're doing. Um, and people, we, we, don't have, we don't have teams in the sense that you're a community team, you're a resi team, you're a sort of commercial team. Um, that would be a bit too dull. Um, we, have, we have teams in the, the, the three directors, Al, Sarah, and I have teams of people that we're managing, and we have different projects within those groups. Um, they will overlap and, and shift around a bit. Um, that's more of a, a day-to-day resourcing question more than, more than anything too, too refined at the moment. Um, but the, I think the more important point there is that we, we try to keep what we're working on quite, um, quite varied. Um, and that's a, that's a very intentional thing. Um, although as much as possible with a, a sort of social intent. So even whether commercial projects, even where they're private residential projects, what are the sort of social benefits that can come from that? Um, that's, a, that's a really important question for us uh, always. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And we have one more question from Anu. Uh, where will you relocate a building like the Albion Street Project when it is so well suited to that specific it's a, I think that's a really, it's a really good question. Um, it, clearly, we um, there's so there are there are two answers to that question. So one, there is a possibility that the the life of that building gets extended on that site. Um, in a way, I I hope that will happen. Um, I suspect it might happen because it's a very difficult site to to redevelop and it's very low on Southwark's housing list. Um, but that said, it was it was very much part of the brief, and it's being developed as a kit of parts. So it's a it's a it's being developed as a panelized thing, and that means that that building in that exact form won't necessarily be realized somewhere else. So it's not like that building with the two little sort of flats will just be built on a different site. It may be that it's reconfigured slightly and turned into something else. Um, that actually all of the the materials and the panels are just used in a slightly different way. So it becomes a, a sort of longer, thinner building or something like that. Um, it's, yeah, that is, that is something to be, to be resolved further down the line. It's not, um, it's not as clear cut as it is a single building that is going to be moved. Um, and we said that was the last question, but there's another question in the chat, which is really nice. So, so I thought I could go for that as an actual last question, unless anyone's got anything else very pressing. Um, so it's from Alison and she says, uh, thanks for an exciting presentation. Gives me some positivity in these times. Um, and also says about the conceptual scribble sections, which are really refreshing to see. Um, and then our question is, um, you say we're not used to that quick and temporary way of working. Do you think architectural education should maybe involve more of this experimentation? Um, and says that she doesn't find much of this liveness aspect at undergrad or part one. Uh, I think there are two parts to that. Um, so experimentation, yes, absolutely. Of course, you should be experimenting. Um, you're studying. You should be you should be playing around and, and having fun, and experimenting with your your projects. Um, I think the other part of that is the the community aspect and the real sort of live part of it. And Clearly, you guys have uh, a sort of a live, a live project part of your course, which is amazing. Um, one of the things that I do when I'm teaching um, is that I, I try to get my sort of my studio to, to go out and, and do some form of community engagement and, and talk to people and understand sort of what people on the ground want and, and think and need because of course that provokes sort of other thoughts and other ideas and a big part of that is is just diversity um and it's about a diversity of opinion and a, a diversity of ideas and um sort of possibility that comes from engaging with lots of people um and actually out of that diversity of thought and diversity of ideas comes the potential for greater creativity and greater innovation. Um, 
whether that means you should you should do something like go and install a, a sort of load of balloons somewhere because you feel like it well you know if you want to um why not <laughs> Okay, great. And just to kind of end on a good note, uh, we have a last comment. Uh, it's good to see an optimistic practice working with community engagement and things they believe in. Gives some hope that architecture school has light at the end of the very long tunnel. And uh, it does. It does. <laughs> and with this one, I think we can wrap it up. And thank you very much, Thomas, for this amazing lecture. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Great. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm sorry I'm not there in person and we can't go to the pub, but hey, one of one of these days. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we can meet in Sheffield at one point. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good luck, everyone. Um, uh, I hope you survive lockdown. Okay. Make sure you keep the spirits up. But um, yeah, there is there is definitely light at the end of your education. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was great. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.